I'm dropping things. Lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it, this dream, into the palms of your hands, molded into the image of your most public self, sculpted into the shape of your most private need. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face and say simply, very simply with hope, good morning. Good morning to all y'all. Good morning. <laughs> give, give my Angela a hand for those words. She's a North Carolinian now. As I try to fix this mic, leadership means you adapt, right? As I came up, somehow this came off. So the people dealing with the mic can tell me if that's OK. Uh, how many of you are morning people? You are definitely not my students. Let me start that way. I go around. I'm really not a, a morning person, but a part of leadership is being able to fake it when you have to, right? You got to be upbeat whether you're feeling or not. So I go around trying to pump them up, and they always go, shh, mm -mm, too, too, uh, too early in the morning somehow. I am delighted to be here, and especially delighted because you are focusing on what some might call the most critical issue America faces in the near future, meaning in the next quarter of a decade, a quarter of a century, quite frankly. And that is, how do we educate people on all levels, and particularly those who may have been challenged because they didn't have the support, and somehow may not come from a background where education has been the name of the game. And he said it well, but no doubt that unfortunately, Fewer than 0.2, fewer than 20% of those at the bottom, in that bottom group right now from any race are graduating from college. I start always with stories, and I've told some of these stories before, but this is one that I think is so important because this is 2013. This is 50 years after 1963, and it's important for educators to understand exactly what has happened in this 50-year period. I like calling this period one of, of, of an experiment. And the experiment has said this, is it possible for a nation to take people of all backgrounds, men and women, and to educate large numbers of them in order for that nation to continue to be one of the most powerful, most productive nations in the world? There are some questions I'm going to ask you, and in the spirit of innovation, my campus is known really for innovation. We are constantly asking ourselves the question, but how can it be better? So we're doing well with this group, but what about this group? And even if we're doing well with one group, is that for everybody in that group or for some people in that group? And are we disaggregating the data to understand who's making it and why and what makes the difference? And the essential point I will be making today is that the language that we use in talking about these issues, in fact, even before that, the vision we have for ourselves as a nation as an educator, as a school system, the way we interact, the questions we ask, the, va the values we hold will shape who we will become in the future. Now, in 63, the world was very different. First of all, we could never in America have seen a group that looks like this. You know that, right? Uh, how many of you, I just wrote a piece and was shocked to figure out uh, that that a lot of Americans were not born by that time in 63. Now watch this. How many of you in this room hadn't come into the world yet in 1963? How many of you are younger than that? Ooh, a lot. And, look, and they, they say it with such pride. Oh, I'm young. Yeah, I got that. I got that. Uh-huh. I saw that look on your face. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And the others say, why would he ask that question? <laughs> so so here, is, here is the deal. Two-thirds of Americans were not, had not been born, are younger than 50 in America. Two thirds. Why do I tell you that? As we think about what we need to do to increase the numbers of those who are succeeding, this notion of the dream we have for our children, the dream we have for our nation, takes shape based on what you are accustomed to seeing. Now, let me ask a question. You saw that, that marching in 63 and in 64, the Civil Rights Act, and in 65, the Higher Education Act. Now, you may not know this, but before the early 60s, it was simply understood primarily that if you were not wealthy, you were not going to college, very few people, and as a rule, many more men than women. 
and you certainly weren't growing if you were, if you were of color, very few, a few who became teachers, one or two doctors here and there, but for the most part, most people didn't do it. And the first time we saw more regular Americans, I mean, just generally, people in general going regardless of race, for example, was in the 40s, and it was with the Veterans Bill, the GI Bill. You've heard of the GI Bill. And in the 40s, for the first time, we had people coming back from the war, and they had a chance to go to college with federal support. What group in America do you think was absolutely opposed to veterans going to college? Anybody know? I, I say it because it has special relevance to my job. College presidents, led by the most prestigious at the time, Robert Hutchins at the University of Chicago. These were the most liberally educated people in the world. And yet they were opposed. They said, in fact, if you put those veterans on our campuses, our campuses will become academic hobo jungles. Now, why do I tell that story? One of my fellow presidents said, why would you even tell that? I said, because first of all, it's the truth. It is the truth. And secondly, we can learn from history. And what is the message that that told me? That sometimes even when we've got all kinds of degrees and all, all this prestige, we still aren't taking the time to think out of the box. Because we tend to see the world the way the world is. If we've not seen it, we often think it cannot be. And yet within several years of that GI Bill's passing, two million veterans were in colleges doing well. And for the first time, Americans saw people who were not from wealth going to college, able to get a job, and taking care of their families. And what does that mean? So in the 60s, when we finally had this Civil Rights Act, which helped more women, which helped people in general, all of a sudden, more people could go to college. I spoke to a school board association in Georgia, and one of the gentlemen who was the head of his school board um, for his county uh, came up for his school system, and he said, I, I want to make a statement. He said, now, everybody sees me. I'm CEO of my company. I am white. I am rich. He said, people assume that I come from money. He said, but what they don't know is my father had died, my mother was a sharecropper, and she saw the little Negro children getting ready to go to college, and she said, I want my kids to go to college. And because of the Higher Education Act, she knew it was possible to get some financial aid. And as a result of that, he said, I was able to go, my sisters were able to go, we were able to move our mother out of poverty, and we're here today. They said, because of what happened in the 60s with that Civil Rights Act that helped all Americans. Give America a hand for making a difference in the 60s. It made a difference for all of us. And so for years, we have been at the top. Okay, here we go. How many of you today are between the ages of 35 and 70? I've got good news and bad. Which one you want first? <laughs> bad news is you're getting old. Get over it. I'm over 60, so I can say that now. Wait a minute. It's okay. It beats the alternative, right? All right. The good news, though, is if you're an American and you're over 35, you are second in the world as the most educated people. Only Norway is slightly better educated. Now, how many of you are between 25 and 34? Mm -hmm. As they raise their hands with pride, yeah, I'm young, yeah. Okay, I got good news and bad. Which one you want first? You know I'm going to get it bad first, right? Uh, you're not as smart as we are. <laughs> but the good news for you, we are so jealous. We wish we were your age, right? Man? <laughs> so it's okay. It's all right. Why do I say we're not as smart as you are? You're down to position number 12. Other countries have gone ahead. 11 countries are ahead of that generation of 25 to 34. And in 1975, amazingly, we were second in the world in the number of bachelor's degrees in math and science, engineering. We were at 4% and Japan was at 6%. Today we're number 20. Today we're number 20. When I chaired the National Academies Committee recently on underrepresentation, it didn't surprise people that a lot of minority kids, black and Hispanic, who started with a major in science and engineering would not make it. So only 20%. It was stunning to learn that only 32% of whites who begin in pre-med or pre-engineering or science actually graduate with a major in those areas. And for Asian Americans, it's only 40%, 41%. Now, the first response from universities is, well, it's a K-12 problem. Well, we do know we want to keep working on these issues, and this is why early college is important to look at the, the bridging of the gaps between high schools and colleges. But what the committee said that shocked people was this, that it's a university problem, that the culture in universities is such 
that we always expect most people not to make it in science, that we've got to change the culture of science teaching in universities. Give me a hand for that idea. <laughs> Let me give you a statistic that will shock you because you, people say, oh, they just didn't have the background. Well, the higher the SATs, the larger the number of AP credits, the more prestigious the university the person attends. When everybody's so excited they went to this prestigious place and that to be a doctor, somehow they come back and they become a lawyer, they go into something else. You know what happens? They get a C or D in that science course. They get an A in something you know, over in the humanities, and so they love the humanities and say, oh, they just love the humanities. Well, if I got an A in humanities and a C or D in chemistry, what is it I love? You love what you're doing well, right? And so I want you to hear what I'm saying, that eat the most prestigious institutions, unfortunately, Unfortunately, most students, particularly if their parents are not from another country, you will see they leave science within the first year. And what is the result? Only 6% of Americans today, 25-year-olds, have degrees in science and engineering. And we are at the bottom. Now, the key to that, and this is why I'm going to get into what we are having to do in science, but also in general, is that our GDP, the gross domestic product, is tied strongly to the science and technology infrastructure. But depending on whether there's a war, there's been a war, anywhere from 50 to 85 percent of our GDP is directly tied to the strength of STEM. And every time the GDP goes up 1 percent, we have a million new jobs in the nation. In every state right now, you'll find large numbers of jobs in STEM that cannot be filled because we don't have enough people. Now, how does that relate to what you're talking about? Here is the point. And he said it earlier today, the fact is that large numbers of students who start college do not graduate, that other students who have the ability, particularly from low-income backgrounds, are not getting what they need to get into college and then don't get the support that they need. How many of you remember when you were in college that the uh, dean said when you were a freshman, look at the student to your left, look at the student to your right, one of you will not graduate, right? That's a terrible thing to say to young people. Because if I'm at all immature as a little kid, I'm thinking, oh, my God, he's telling me I'm not going to graduate. I may as well part of this year because I'm going to be gone next year anyway. <laughs> and so I go ahead and have a ball, and then I go, Ma, he told me I wasn't going to graduate. So I just had a good time, right? So we say this. Okay, you're now freshman in college, all of you. Follow my instructions. Look at the student to your left. Look to your left. Look at the student to your right. Our goal is to make sure all three of you graduate. And if you don't, we fail, and we don't plan to fail. Give me a hand for that approach. <laughs> we don't plan to fail. It makes all the difference in the world. So what I want to do, I want you to think about this. The, the challenge that we face is that we all know we need more people who are educated. We also know, though, anybody in this room would know, without an education, the question would be, what would you be doing today? Where would you be if you hadn't gotten an education that allowed you to have the skills to have a job and, quite frankly, to do well enough that people send you to a conference to learn how you help other people's children? Think about it. I mean, so we know the foundation of our success has to do with education. The big question is whether we're in middle school, elementary, high school, or college, has everything to do with how do we help more students succeed. And what I want to do with some specificity is to talk with just that specificity about the kinds of things that can be done to make a difference. And, and I start with the notion that for 40 years, I have been asking the question, how do we help more American kids, black kids, white kids, all kinds of students, to succeed in math and science? Because most Americans don't feel good about math. Watch this. How many of you in the room love to read? It's an American value. We love to read. Now, the fact is, all of you can read, and about half of you really love to read. Some will read, you know, the paper. You might read the sports section. You might read the, you know, others read books, all right? But the point is you can read, but most important, you'd be embarrassed to say that you don't like reading. Now, watch this, all right? I want a truthful answer now. You know what I'm about to ask, right? How many of you love mathematics? All right, I see my math teachers. I know y'all math teachers. I know that. <laughs> I already know that. I love it. I love it. Because wait a minute, I have always gotten goosebumps doing math, always. Teacher would give us 10 problems, and I said, teacher, give us 10 more. And the whole class would go, shut up, Freeman. <laughs> I had a designated kicker every day of my life. I mean, there was somebody that said, kick him, kick him. Wait a minute, because I was always wanting more math problems, always wanting more. Well, the, the key is this. For mo How many of you, tell the truth, don't really love math and maybe are a little uncomfortable with it? Tell the truth. Let me see your hands. Come on. 
It's an American issue. It really is. And the one question I'm going to give you, I always give a math problem. Not a math problem today, but this is a question I want you to think about, and it's at the heart of what I'm going to be saying. And that is that we want to think about how we support teachers so that the teaching that goes on is as effective as possible. I have often said to my students and colleagues, it's much easier for someone to get an A in a math course, him or herself, than it is to teach somebody else to get that score because you can intuitively sometimes get to an answer. But when you have to explain it with clarity to somebody who's afraid, you know, and, and, and when you have to use different approaches because people learn in different ways, you've got to have a much deeper understanding of the concepts to be able to do it. So there's one question I'm going to ask each of you, and everybody will have a reaction. The question is this. What is a function? What is a function? And in the Common Core Standards, you'll see that term function. Now, everybody in here took it. How many of you took algebra some, at some point? How many of you found it a wonderful experience? <laughs> you sure that? Look around. <laughs> you, I can tell you're good religious people because you tell the truth. You said, no, it wasn't a wonderful experience. <laughs> Wait a minute. But everybody in here, whether you liked it or not, you remember the term f of x. If you didn't remember anything else, you remember that a function was f of x. All right? Now, I have asked, I have asked engineers. I've asked physicians, get up and tell me as if I'm a 12-year-old a what a function is. And most people will say, well, I can plug in the numbers and give you the answer. But I said, no, tell me what it means. And for the most part, we Americans cannot do that. So your, your assignment today, you got this? Working with math teachers and others is to be able to understand the concept of a function so well you could explain it to somebody in the seventh grade. Now, why am I asking you to do that? Because at the heart of the success of our students will be their ability to read critically and to solve math. If we could get children to the point where they're enjoying reading and can read, and we teach them something about word problems, they are on their way. When you talk about standardized tests, you know, everybody often will say, oh, the test is culturally biased or it's not for this group. You know, I'm, I'm sometimes in, with minority groups, and they say, that test isn't, isn't fair. It's not fair to black people. It's not fair, fair to Hispanic people. And then I say, well, well, years ago, I wrote the questions for the math SAT. And then they look at me, they want to throw eggs at me, right? Wait a minute. I say, I think I'm black the last time I saw it. So I don't, <laughs> I don't think it's culturally biased. No, it's about the ability to think critically to read and think critically. And when somebody says to me, well, I don't think we should have to worry about the test because I've got my grades. Well, grades vary. You all know this, depending on the school. You know, and somebody says, I want to be a doctor, and I like people. And I say this, okay, you want to be a doctor, you can't pass the test, but you got grades at your school, so I'm on the, somebody's on the surgery table. And you come in as a doctor and you say, I like people. <laughs> but I can't pass the test but I'm going to cut on you. I don't think so. In other words, either finally you know it and you can prove it or you don't. Give me a hand for that idea, please. Either you know it and you can prove it or you don't. When I'm working with high school kids who are in certification programs, uh, what is so interesting is they have to finally understand that when they're on that job, either they're able to perform the task and get it right or that job will not want them continuing to work there. And so what we've been working to do on my campus is to look at ways of improving instruction because on most of our campuses, what you'll find is, and even in high school, most kids end up not doing well enough in math and science to consider it as a major, if even possibly. And so what I want you to do when you get a chance is to go to, at the UMBC site, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, go to what's called the, the uh, CDC. It's the Chemistry Discovery Center. And the, the purpose of the Chemistry Discovery Center is to be the place where we teach first year chemistry first. And we have moved away from lecturing. Let me ask you a question. How many people in this room know that most kids are bored at least part of the day, if not all the day in school? Tell the truth, that they're bored. We know that this generation, I don't care whether they're low income or whatever, uh, that, that they are accustomed to multitasking. They are accustomed to using the technology. They're accustomed to not to have to sit there and just listen to somebody. And the neuroscience research will tell you, nobody can listen for more than 20-some minutes anyway. 
with God. See, already you all are starting to think about lunch <laughs> as you sit right here. So what you're hearing me do in the spirit of Daniel Pink and a whole new mind is to constantly ask you questions to make you as actively involved, even in this kind of keynote, as possible, rather than you're just sitting there. How many of you believe that there are many more brilliant Chinese and Indian children than American children? When I ask American audiences that, the first reaction is, don't you believe in your country? Our kids are as smart as anybody else. What are you talking about? Why would you ask that? Because it sounds like something would make you cringe, right? I, I'll ask it again. How many of you believe that there are many more brilliant Chinese and Indian children than American children? I wanted to begin to think about it, right? It is not a politically incorrect question. It is a mathematical question. There are 1.3 billion Chinese, right? 1.1 billion Indians. You put those two together, you have 2.4 billion people. Now, the top 10% of any population will be extraordinary. What is 10% of 2.4 billion? Don't let me leave here saying you don't know the math now. Because <laughs> I will talk about you. I want you, I will, especially my math majors, the teachers over there. <laughs> what, what is 10% of 2.4 billion? 240 million, right? How many Americans are there in total? About 310 or so, something like that, all right? So those two countries have almost as many geniuses as we have citizens. Think about it. You know, we are so accustomed to being American-centric, but understand the brain power is enormous there. And India is in the process of building 800 additional universities. Hear that? 800 additional universities. If you go to anybody's PhD program from UMBC, where we've got PhDs in human-centered computing and cybersecurity, all the way up to MIT, what you're going to see is that the majority of kids in those grad programs are from those countries. And it has everything to do with the population sizes. And it has to do with the fact that an extraordinarily large percentage of the, mo of the highest achieving Americans throughout the 20th century had parents from other countries. Most, I mean, many of the Nobel laureates in America, even today, tend to have, and throughout the 20th century, had parents who came from European countries. They lived in New York. They went to the poor man's Harvard, City College, Brooklyn College, and they went on and got amazingly, the Nobel Prize. Why? It was the hunger for the work. It was that excitement about being in America. It was the idea that anything is possible if you really work hard to get that education. You know, as Paul Tuff says and others, and you talk about it here some, the idea of the resilience and the hunger. When I'm looking to figure out how to help students succeed, I'm always trying to figure, is there that fire in the belly? And if there isn't it there, what do we have to do? And that's where I get back to the idea of the boredom. The question is, how do we connect students to work that will get them inspired? One of the advantages of the early child, of the early college experience is clearly to have a vision already of where they can go, of what the work leads to. The biggest question I get from students in high school is, why must I take this geometry? What difference will it make? I will tell you that the most effective teaching of geometry and some of the development of math I've ever seen was in L.A. at a community college where they were working on green construction. And by the time they finished using triangles and squares and perpendiculars and things in building that house, these people were proficient not just in geometry. They could pass the first year of the math that they had there and didn't even realize they were doing it because it was hands-on. The more hands-on experiences we have, the better off we have. Years ago, I served as a, uh, one of the representatives of this country to um, Germany and Japan as a part of a trilateral study group. We were studying competition in Germany, Japan, and America. And I think the most effective approaches I saw were twofold. Number one, in Germany, the apprenticeship programs in chemistry. The students who were not going on to the university, who had become, were going to become technicians, they and their teachers were going out to companies to apply what they were using in the classroom in real situations, and they were being paid for it. And the amazing point was that these kids who were not the top students in Germany, when they when they took the international exam, did better than our AP chemistry graduates with fives because they had had hands-on experiences and the work related to something they saw as real, not simply as a test. And the other example that was amazing had to do with the, the Bushy Band classes, the idea of, of classes, uh, pre, um, the, uh, the after-school classes. And the most fascinating classes to me were the classes for kids before they went to kindergarten. Now, American mothers go, oh, that's too much pressure to have those children having to work before kindergarten to get into the right kindergarten. 
Well, I would argue that as we talk about early college, as I get into some of the specifics involving things we're doing to make a difference in teaching and learning, that we should be, as a college president, as somebody in the high school, as somebody in the middle school, we should be as concerned about what happens in pre-K as we are what happens in PhD programs. <laughs> Starting with that pre-K. Very important, because those years, it's amazing what the reading and thinking at that level will do to set the foundation. So I mentioned the Chemistry Discovery Center because here is the point. We have decided that it is counterproductive to focus primarily on lecturing in those courses, in our first year courses. At first STEM, and now we've moved over to other areas. Uh, and, and, and the reason is that when you are simply lecturing, students are doing a million other things. They are not actively engaged, and quite frankly, they are not focused on the work. And so if you look at how we teach chemistry now, it is with the notion that we will not give them the theories, they will struggle to discover the theories. We use problems out of the biotech companies on our campus. We've got about 100 companies on campus, biotech and IT companies, started by faculty, in some cases by new, new students. But we've got problems that are real life problems, and they have to work in groups of four, and they're not allowed to work simply with people they know. We are constantly saying, get out of your comfort zone. So we randomly assign them. And there is a specific role for each student. There's a project manager. There's a blogger. There is a scribe. There's a researcher. They cannot sit there and do their own work. There's a whiteboard. They've got the terminal there. And the, the professor is walking around, looking at the master terminal to see what they're doing, but then walking around and helping them when they get stuck. Now, I will tell you that my students will tell you in a heartbeat, first part of the semester, I hate that course because I don't need anybody. A lot of students, I mean, from high school, have felt they are supposed to work only by themselves. And the idea of having to work with other people with a part of their grade, depending on their ability to work in a group, seems to them unfair because they're saying, why should I have to worry about what somebody else can do? And what we're saying is, in the real world, your final performance is never simply based on what you can do. It's based on how you can work with effectively with other people in addition to that. Now, what is interesting is that as we are working with high schools, as we are connecting with community colleges, we are sharing best practices. We've got a Gates grant. I know that some people here from Montgomery College, I was with some people last night who are um, in Montgomery County for one of their programs for low-income kids speaking late last night, in fact, at 809 on their college tracks program, which focuses on low-income kids, first-generation college kids, helping them to do the things necessary to be able first to get into college. And, and from my perspective, and some of those students may be taking some courses before they finish, others are waiting until they graduate, but here's the point, that as you know, for first-generation college students, the process of getting into college can be very challenging. I mean, for middle class people, have you ever tried to fill out those financial aid forms? That FAFSA? I mean, you've got to be really good. It's like RS, right? I mean, you, you really need help to do all of that. And it can be intimidating to somebody who's not done it before. But it's not just the filling out of the papers. It's deciding on the best fit of institution, for example. It's looking at Montgomery College and other places. But then, the ex then even when they get in, I would argue there's a need more and more, whether it is an early college student or a student who's just started from another place to have the kind of connecting that will tie somebody from the past with the new person so that they can constantly be talking about what's going on. Now, let me tell you why we've come to this point, why we got to this point in terms of chemistry discovery, in terms of what we do in physics, what we do in math, even what we do in English now. We have gotten away from the lecture. We have learned that you can use a group work, group approach, use digital humanities, use stories, but teach students how to write even more critically by teaching them how to critique each other and constantly going back and forth in arguing about the clarity of something, the coherence of something, having them involved in the process. If there's one thing I want you to think about, it is the notion of student engagement. Our motto in America right now especially when you get middle school and up, is that typically we talk about kids thinking, I'll open my head, I'll go into the class, the teacher will pour in the knowledge, I'll go home and memorize it, and I'll come back and I'll write it down on the test. So when my fluid mechanics teacher told them that she was, I mean, in the engineering math course, they were going to flip the courses, 
and that the students would, would be responsible for, for every time for studying a video on a new concept first and then trying to work problems either in person or on the Blackboard course management system with other students and that the course in class time would be spent focusing on what the students didn't understand. The first reaction from rebellious students was, well, if we do all that, what are we paying you for? You're supposed to tell us what we have to do because that is what we've taught students. The teachers are there to tell you what you're supposed to know, and then the student is there to tell you what they told you. Think about it. So I'm saying to you that innovation, whether it is at any level, middle school, high school, college, innovation involves looking at how we do things, looking in the mirror, finding that which is good, because there are times when lecturing is important, of course, finding what's good about the relationship between a professor or a teacher and children and young people, and then determining what is not effective. And it makes all the difference in the world. Now here is the thought I want you to have. When I looked at what was happening in America 25 years ago to see that I could not find one predominantly white university that had been successful in educating African Americans in STEM meaning at least five kids who would be so well, have done so well, they could go on and get PhDs. I could not find one. And remember in 1963, every university was founded either for blacks or for whites in the South. And in the North, quite frankly, even though you may have had one or two going there, when I was at Illinois uh, in grad school, they had their first group of blacks to come there in the late 60s. Before that, they'd had one here, one there, but there was no idea that large numbers would come. That was America at the time. The experiment that I'm talking about is saying all kinds of institutions should have all kinds of students. And we've made a lot of success in a lot of ways. There's no doubt about that. But in the science and tech area, we still are a long ways off. Let me just give you one other result. If you look at health disparities in our country, you're talking about billions of dollars being spent every year because poor people and people of color are much less healthy than others. And the more health problems you have, the more it costs, and the more you go to emergency rooms, and the more disease, and all of that. And if you look at the scientists who are studying those issues, you will find that people from those disadvantaged populations are not represented. For example, a part of my work in Washington right now is looking at what are the numbers. Well, under 1% of the scientists at the National Institutes of Health are black. Under 1%. If you look at, you talk about poor whites, think about it. If we are telling you that, that poor whites in very small numbers end up graduating from college, then you know there are not going to be a lot of people from poverty of any race who are represented in the science and tech workforce to understand some of the challenges that go with poverty, regardless of race. And so part of what we're working to do here is to figure out how we create leaders from all these groups that can help us with the problems we face for all people because it can make us much more productive as a society, but quite frankly, it can save lives and it can help us with issues like intelligence. I was at the Pentagon yesterday and, and they were saying they're working now. They, they realize that certain parts of the armed forces don't look completely like America. You need more women at the top levels in Navy, more people of color. They will say that to you. The Chief of Naval Operations said we've got to get more who are in science and tech interested in protecting our country who are STEM kinds of people. And so the question for you becomes, what are those specific approaches that can be used? I just mentioned to you this idea of chemistry discovery. The Meyerhoff program is the program we have that was talked about on 60 Minutes. The vision that we had was this. Is it possible to create a program that will produce kids who are so high achieving that they could become leaders in America? Not just basically barely make it but become really that good. It's like Browning's quote, oh, that a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for. And people laughed. Now, I'll tell you why they laughed. They weren't being cruel. They just said, Freeman, you're shooting too high. It's not time to have large numbers of minority kids with PhDs because they, it's going to take generations. And this is the thinking in the scientific community. And the issue, the real issue is it takes so long, as you know, to go that far. Well, the key for us has been setting high expectations building community, treating it as a kind of experiment in which we look at how students are doing to understand what it is they need to do, but also what it is we need to do. And as a result, to see how we can push people to be better and better and better. And, and what is amazing about this is that before we started that program, we had never had a black educated in this country to earn an A in any upper level science course, ever. 
and what you may not know is that most institutions have not had an African American educated in this country who's gotten an A in organic chemistry, for example, or in genetics, or in, you know. And so to solve a problem, you have to first state the problem. Now, when I first did the data analysis and I said this, I had people on, I had blacks and whites who were saying, why would you tell people that, that we've never had? Everybody got angry at me, all right? So one of my points to you as a leader is that true leadership means keeping everybody minimally dissatisfied. <laughs> I want you to think about it. Give me a hand for that. It's got a lot of wisdom to it. Keep everybody minimally dissatisfied. You know, when people are a little perturbed or academically speaking, a little pissed at you, it means you're probably doing something that's good, okay? You just want, you, but if you get one group that's too happy, another group is going to be way down here, right? And, and, and amazingly, but this is what I want you to think about. When you disaggregate the data in your schools and you look at who is winning or succeeding and who is not, it's always uncomfortable. But a part of the message about making a difference in solving problems is to be able to state the challenge clearly and in a way that builds trust among people. Because if you can state it like a math problem, you can begin attacking it from different angles. And, that, and so what we saw was that, as is the case for all of you, typically the boys of color and a lot of low-income white boys are at the bottom. If you look at what's happening in college, you'll see that boys are not going to college at the same rate as girls. We are down to 40-some percent. And Specificity is another theme I want you to write down. Specificity is critical. What do I mean? Well, in some areas, girls are doing better. In technology areas, we as a, as a country are not doing well. In fact, there has been a 50% decline in the number of women majoring in computer science just since 2000, in the percentage. In 2000, we'd gotten up to about 36%. We are down, folks, in the country now to 18% of all the majors in college being in computer science, of all the computer science majors being women. And why is that a problem? We're going to have about a million and a half jobs at all levels, two and four year levels, that are open that we don't see where we're going to have the people to fill those jobs in between now and something like the next eight years. And a lot of those jobs are in areas of intelligence and defense. My campus is really hot in cybersecurity because the National Security Agency is 20 minutes from our campus, right there in the Baltimore, Washington, Carter. We've got 950 graduates. 